The nation watched quietly as King was placed in solitary confinement. 1963 would mark Dr. King's lowest point as leader of the civil rights movement. It had been eight long years since his only major victory with Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott. When I first met Dr. King, the mission he was embarking on was completely unknown to him. He had the foggiest idea where it would lead, and certainly going to Birmingham was a choice of enormous consequence. It was a battlefield where the movement could sink or swim. Birmingham, to be perfectly honest, was a grim place through the eyes of African Americans. It was the most rigid, uh, the most violent, the most vicious. It was the biggest and baddest city in the South. We nicknamed it Birmingham. Frankly, compared to other places, there's no racial unrest in Birmingham. There'd been 60 unsolved bombings in Birmingham, and the local police had never arrested a soul. The Ku Klux Klan was big in Birmingham, all through the police department and up into City Hall. Life in Birmingham, as far as I'm concerned, is hell. I don't believe in the mixing of the races, and I don't care what anybody says. I might be prejudiced. I don't know. I probably am. But... As a kid, I always wanted to eat at Newberry's downtown, and I always wanted to be hamburger plate. Always. We couldn't have that. I went downtown to the Newberry's, and I was so happy because I could sit on the little black stools that twirled and order me a hot dog with everything on it. I'm not going to integrate. <laughs> Instead of serving me, they called in the police. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. I never could understand why white people hated us. As a kid, I just felt like they thought some of the black would rub off on them, you know? Well, Birmingham is a symbol of hardcore resistance to integration. Wait under this philosophy. You can never whip these boys if you don't keep you and them separate. The good people of Birmingham had put Bull Connor in office seven times. Bull Connor. That's a Bull Connor with the monster. His title was Commissioner of Public Safety, and his mission was to keep the streets safe for white people. He had a tank. Army tank? White. Under Bull Connor, Birmingham was the closest thing in America to a police state. So the theory was, we need to bring all this out in the open. And if they're going to kill us, let them kill us in the middle of the day, not at night one at a time. Most black people were afraid of the movement. My mom was scared. She would always say, don't make any waves. See, our parents, they couldn't go because they was working for the whites. If they were seen on the picket line, then they ended up losing their job or having their house foreclosed or having their car repossessed. So the parents couldn't do it. As a kid, we always wanted to think that these things would stop soon. 
and uh, that mom and dad, since they fixed everything else, that they would fix it. We thought that you could just uh, shame the white man into, look how bad you treat your Negroes, you know. But I found out that they were determined not to give one inch. Dr. King had gone to jail in hopes that thousands of protesters would follow his example and overwhelm the system. But it didn't work out that way. The blacks of Birmingham stayed home and the press quickly lost interest. Is he still in solitary confinement? Yes, he is. Uh -huh. I think he'll be there for a while. I don't know just when he'll be coming out. One of the last things King did before going to jail was to place an urgent call to a fiery young preacher in Mississippi by the name of James Bevel. Bevel was a secret weapon. He was the brain of the bunch. He was obnoxious as the devil, but that was his role. Well, I knew that the Birmingham project was going very slow because they couldn't get many people to go to jail. So what we got to do is go out and organize young people. The first thing I said, well, who did this doctor? They told me, Tall Paul was there and Shelly the Playboy, and they agreed with nonviolence. And... I was somewhat of a uh, crazy guy, I guess. What's up, brother? Shelly Stewart, he was the DJ for real back during the day. And he had a red car and had Shelly the Playboy written on it. Good goobly woobly. Shelly the Playboy was the mouth of the South. What's up, everybody? No one had a closer relationship with the kids in Birmingham. Make some noise, everybody! Make some noise! Woo! Being on the air, you had music, which was the bait. But each time you have an opportunity, you talk about freedom. You talk about rights. Didn't take very much to get the kids. The kids knew. They knew. We started with the football players and the cheerleaders and the beauty queen. I was an 88-pound majorette. I got involved in moving because I was talking to a little pretty girl. Ooh, I can see myself wearing long skirts, donut socks. Good morning, little school girl. Good morning, little school girl. We broke it down very simply. Look, you can get hit by a baseball bat playing baseball. But segregation destroys the inside of your mind and your soul, and it doesn't heal that easily. I played football on the football team. I played defensive tackle. Reverend Bevel asked, have you ever wondered why your helmets are always blue and white, but your school colors are green and gray? He said, you get the equipment that the white schools discard. I'm glad I chose the movement and not athletics. Bevel would turn down the lights and show a movie from the sit-in movement in Nashville. I saw a bunch of colored sitting on the stools. They looked like they were just trying to egg on a fight. The stark reality of nonviolence being met with violence was shocking and scary, and it drew kids in by the hundreds. Bevel would tell us, Ms. Cotton would tell us, if you cannot restrain from being violent, maybe the movement was not for you. Well, that was a beautiful concept after you think about it later. But when you get your head knocked on, you really got to think real hard and twice. Because the fellas down on 15th Street those fellows would fight back. They came to fight. But because of Dr. King and them girls, they would say, y'all come on, cooperate. We need a peaceful protest. On Saturday, April 20th, Dr. King bonded out of jail. His release caused barely a ripple. We were defeated here in Birmingham. They had, they had beaten us down into the ground. Dr. King, in our strategy session, says that the only way to break Birmingham, we're going to have to fill the jails. So I say, I agree. I absolutely agree with you on that. 
Now, how I feel to jail is my business. <laughs> I remember that night, Dr. King speaking, he was trying like mad to get somebody to go to jail, and they just didn't stand. I remember King inviting any volunteers to go to jail the next day, and nobody stood up but us kids. That was it. Nobody volunteered but those kids. Dr. King said no. Good morning, children. This is Shelly the Playboy here on WBNN. D-Day was the day, I tell you. This was the day where every student in Birmingham knew that it was going to happen. But you've got to remember that all of the planning was a secret. Good. Google Google. Good morning, children. The DJs would talk in code and use songs from the hit parade as signals for action. I remember that morning I woke up with my mind on freedom. Oh, I took special pain with putting a little starch in my blouse. Got my toothbrush and... Uh, I got the toothpaste, the soap, because I had a feeling that I wouldn't be coming home. Ring, ring, goes the bell. This doctor pushed D-Day early in the morning, but they wouldn't even use D-Day. They, they used all that jive talk. <laughs> Don't forget, kids, there's going to be a party in the park, and Don't forget your toothbrushes, because luncheon will be served. Back in the classroom, open your book. Now, everybody who's listening knows what the deal is. D-Day was the day. My mother said, OK, Gwen. Don't go to that march. Hey, I mean, don't go. You go to school. I told my mother, I said, I hear you. We were raised not to lie. Mm -mm. So I didn't tell her lies that I wasn't going. I said, I hear you. We would have people picked out. Your job is to turn this fire alarm, turn that fire alarm, get the football team, basketball team, get the cheerleaders, get the band. It was right at 11 o'clock when they arrived. They came up to the fence with a sign that just said, it's time. When we said, let's go, go for the window. And I told the others, come on, let's go. And I looked around and, you know, all I could see was my own fanny almost, you know. <laughs> I hollered back up at those kids, but you said you were gonna go. You know, you, you promised. And that's when kids started coming. They were coming out of windows, coming out of doors. It's so beautiful. You wouldn't believe it. Mrs. Story turned her back as we got up. And we took it from there. I wanted to walk out with them, but it was my job. There was nothing you could do once the students started moving, the principal, the teachers, and everybody had to step aside. My boyfriend tried to stop me from going, and I walked around the building, and I came right back. I didn't want to get. You have about two children left in the class, maybe. Everybody's gone. I'm sure that morning, Bevel was nervous about who was going to show up. At first, there were a few, then there were hundreds, then there were thousands. We heard that kids were coming in from all over the city. And when we heard that they were coming in from out of town, we got more excited. And I had a cool call, you know. They said, OK, we need you to go out to Fairfield. There's some students outside the classroom that won't go back in. Lo and behold, when I got out to Fairfield, the whole campus was outside of the building. And they all said, we're going to Birmingham. 20 kids climbed on the car, and 800 followed behind him. The more we walked, the more we gathered. And every, every once in a while, you look back, and you saw it was more kids coming from somewhere, from another direction. You said, where are all these kids coming from? You had never seen that many people in your life. It's like a football game. Kids walk as far as 18 miles to get to Birmingham in order to be arrested. And the purpose was to go to jail. 
The gathering place was 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, we poured into 16th Street like a waterfall. They were coming in all doors, from all directions, from the basement, from the back. It was just like one big pep rally. Here's Park, are you in the house? Or Western, are you in the house? The rules are here for Western High Children were ready. They were ready to hit the streets. Kelly Ingram Park was the big green buffer between Black Birmingham and the white downtown. 16th Street Baptist Church was on one corner, and by noon, Birmingham's finest were on the other. It was all laid out like a battlefield. 